This is, in fact, the first issue of Wired. It was published 26 years ago, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, and, you know, we started it, my partner Louis and Rosetto and I were living in Amsterdam. We were making a magazine called Electric Word. This was the sort of consumer uh, manifestation of that. And um, so we were sort of expatriates. We were, you know, misfits to a certain extent. We had um, partners, uh, uh, John Plunkett and Barbara Coor, who are creative directors, also expatriates, also misfits. Uh, and we basically declared, you know, the digital revolution, my, my partner actually coined that phrase, um, because we were looking at um, all of the man-machine interface uh, technologies at the time on behalf of a translation company that was doing translation software. And uh, from there, we were like, okay, the killer app is maybe not desktop publishing. There's maybe something more interesting. And so we began looking into um, natural language processing and um, neuro-linguistic programming and um, cognitive science and all this other stuff. And then at the same time, we were in um, Holland, and we were looking at a company like Philips, whose consumer electronics devices were increasingly becoming uh, digital media readers. So whether it was music or uh, video. Um, then we went to San Francisco, to Macworld, to talk about, of course, desktop publishing. Uh, and we met these people who had these crazy ideas about changing the world with computers. And so you know, we came back and said, this is going to change everything, and it's going to rip this um, technology out of the hands of the engineers with the pocket protectors and the air-conditioned labs, and it's going to rip through our living rooms and bedrooms and offices and um, theaters and movie houses and state houses and all the rest of it. So we declared a digital revolution, um, and we were sort of like a pirate ship, you know, setting out to, uh, to figure this out. Um, we ended up hiring some amazing people, right? We had Bruce Sterling, who was a, um, is a science fiction author and arguably the father of the whole cyberpunk movement, writing about the future of war. Um, we also had Kevin Kelly, who um, at the time was at the Whole Earth Review. He took a sabbatical to help us launch Wired, and then took a sabbatical from Wired to launch his book, uh, which he is now celebrating the 25th anniversary of. It was called Out of Control, um, the New Biology of Machine, Social Systems, and the Economic World. And the original subtitle of that was Fast Forward into a Neobiological Civilization. And so when I came up with this idea for Neolife, it was like, wait, Neolife, Neobiological, it's Kevin. It all goes back to Kevin. And he was dreaming of these things 25 years ago. So, um, you know, the magazine quickly became um, required reading. You know, uh, Al Gore had... Um, boxes of it shipped to the Blair House um, every month. Um, we were shipping to creative artists agencies. We were shipping magazines to the International Labor Organization and the European Space Agency. And we very quickly became required reading for computer science schools, um, business schools, design schools, um, you know, entertainment, and so forth. It really was the story of our times. And in fact, Ad Age famously um, called it the magazine of the decade. Um, and so, um, so then we launched Wired in Japan in 1994. And in 1995, we did a partnership with the Guardian Media Group and launched Wired UK. Did anybody here, is anybody here old enough to have read Wired UK's original version? Thank you, that's one person. Two, three. OK, you're all really old. <laughs> um, it was not long lived. Turns out that um, a big part of what people were excited about was actually reading the American edition, not just because it was big and fat and telling everybody about what was happening in Silicon Valley, but it was because of the ads. And the ads were actually um, describing these new companies and their price points and what they were doing. And um, that turned out to be just as valuable to the UK audience as, um, as the content itself. So imagine that. People liked ads. Hmm. Uh, Anyway, uh, we ultimately sold the company to Condé Nast, and I got out of media altogether. And in fact, it kind of got to this point in my mind where, you know, we were revolutionaries, we were pirates, you know, we were all about the digital revolution, and basically, the revolution's over. We won. You know, what was cult has become culture. And so I moved on. I got involved in other things, and um, I got out of media altogether. Um, but the next thing that happened is this. You've probably all seen this slide. If you've ever been to a health conference, you've seen this slide. Um, and we've heard all this morning about you know, the amazing things that have been enabled, whether it's 
um, genome editing or sequencing or synthesis, whether it's um, sensors everywhere, it could be imaging technologies. Mary Lou and, and Poppy were telling us amazing things today. Um, you know, we've also got um, machine learning and neural networks we just heard about, all these technologies that allow us to not only capture all of this data, but actually figure things out, start to see patterns, start to see correlations, and increasingly start to see causations. So, um, so that start to got, started to get me um, interested in um, where this was all going next. And I discovered that um, technology is pushing the boundaries of biology forward, and we are going to use this in extraordinary ways to literally transform our species. And so I declared a neobiological revolution, and I've announced that this is the next stage of the digital revolution, because it's always about revolution with me. So um, you, what are the frontiers of this revolution? You know, normally here is where I would talk about what we're doing at Neolife and some of the companies that we're covering, the people and the technologies and the tools and so forth. But I'm going to skip all of that because um, I've just celebrated the second anniversary of Neolife, and I'm thinking about um, how to have greater impact, how to move this conversation forward, and really why I wanted to start this in the first place. And it's basically because we have the tools to transform ourselves. And they're popping up all over the place and people working in all these different fields. I know that the neuroscientists aren't talking to the geneticists. Nobody's talking to um, uh, you know, the nutritionists. Nobody understands the microbiome yet. You know, there's all these longevity things and the body hackers and the biohackers and everybody's out there doing their own little bit of this. Um, but where is it that this is all going? You know, there are genetic engineers out there who are really thinking about optimizing humans, right? I mean, there's, a, there's some protective alleles that we could be trying to, um, to get for ourselves. For instance, there's CCR5. Um, you know, there are now three patients that have been cured from HIV infection using a CCR5 gene knockout. That's incredibly exciting. There's also the GRIN, G-R-I-N-2-B, um, which is a protective allele that actually shows benefits for learning and for memory. There's TERT, T-E-R-T, um, which protects our telomeres and could have an impact for longevity. There's also PDE4B, uh, which if you have this, have this, you tend to have reduced anxiety. So there are people who know this. There are papers being published, and there are people out there experimenting in mice, in rats, in humans, maybe. Um, or another thing, another way of thinking about this, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff happening, right? Cryptocurrency is great, and everybody's all excited about cannabis, and of course, AI is everything in Silicon Valley. Um, but so is space, right? And so space could be a major driver for innovation um, in this field. So there is um, LRP5, which is a gene that actually um, confers extra strong bones. So that might be helpful for somebody who is traveling into outer space and dealing with gravity. There are four different mutations when combined together can increase our resistance to radiation. We might just select embryos for small stature, right? Because you've got to hurdle around in a you know, little steel capsule. Uh, it might be good to be small. Or we could optimize for emotional adaptability, either the ability to be alone for an extended period of time or the ability to be in a small capsule with other people for an extended period of time. So that kind of emotional um, adaptability could be desirable. But um, you know, the point is, there's lots of people working on this stuff. They could be academics. They could be state-sponsored, or they could be academics in, in university situations. Does anybody know who this is? Dr. Zhang Kui He, Dr. He Zhang Kui. Or we call him JK, because that's hard to say in Chinese. Um, he, uh, is probably, we don't know for a fact, but he's probably the first scientist to have edited the DNA of human embryos that were then implanted and born. Twin girls born in China in November, um, Lulu and Nana. So he announces this at the second uh, International Conference on Human Genome Editing. And you know he was probably expecting a standing ovation, if not a Nobel Prize. And in fact, what he got was this round um, uh, out outcry of how could you do this, and you know, don't, don't we have a moratorium on um, editing human genomes, and um, you know, how could your institution allow this to happen? And you know, nobody really knows the story that's really, really interesting. Um, but the problem with, with this story is that 
you know, he says, look, I was just trying to protect these little girls from getting HIV from their father, right? But it's a slippery slope because the CCR5 gene that he knocked out that protects us from HIV infection has also shown um, memory and learning uh, benefits in mice and rats. So was all of this a big front? Was he really trying to get a cognitive enhancement? And so how do you tell the difference between repairing and, and improving and bringing someone back up to baseline or pushing them a little bit forward or pushing them way far forward into you know, full-on enhancement? This is just one of the actors uh, that we're looking at. This is another one. This is uh, Josiah Zayner. He has a PhD in molecular uh, biology um, from the University of Chicago. He worked as an astrobiologist at NASA. He considers himself a citizen scientist um, and also a biopunk. You know? But the fact is he's out there offering to do a custom CRISPR edit for you. Just email him, PayPal, 150 bucks. He'll mail you your custom, custom CRISPR edit. He encourages people to do stuff on themselves. He also encourages other biohackers to maybe reverse engineer a pharmaceutical drug that's too expensive that we should all be able to afford. So there's people like Josiah out there. And by the way, he's not alone. You know, there are 169 at last count. This is already 18 month old. 169 different um, biomaker spaces uh, around the world. 169 different bio, bio labs. That's kind of amazing. What percentage of them do you think are in the United States? 50, 75, 85, right? We're the makers, we're the DIY people. No, 30% are in the United States. These are labs all over the world. You know, I met people from Bangalore and Bangkok and Colombia and, you know, China. Um, this is out there. And then there's a whole nother category of people. This is Stellark. Uh, back in the 80s, he was hooking up sensors to his body um, and had a robotic arm and he was uh, taking in all this metabolic data and transforming it into um, laser and sound and so forth. This is what he's up to now. He took a little scaffold. He did a little tissue engineering. He grafted an ear onto his forearm, and then he um, hooked it up to the internet and put a microphone in there. So this is the internet of weird things. <laughs> um, but he's sort of the patron saint of the grinder movement, you know, the, the transhumanists, people who, you know, may actually end up doing, you know, horns or tails or, you know, whatever the weird sci-fi thing was that, uh, that piques somebody's interest. Um, and so, you know, we have to think about um, the fact that this is us working it out. We're trying to figure out um, through our books and our television shows and our films, you know, what it means to consciously direct our own evolution. And, you know, the fact is that um, we don't have a plan. There's no strategic plan. There's no creative brief. There's no product roadmap. Should we do a SWOT analysis? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Well, I think the way forward is perhaps to think about some scenarios. And what do you do in scenario planning? You think about what are the variables that are going to impact the future of our species? Certainly technology. Will biotechnologies advance at the same rate of Moore's law? Will we see the same kind of breakthroughs and um, innovation and wealth creation that we saw? Will in vitro fertilization become less expensive, less painful, and less emotionally taxing? Um, what about ecological disaster? There could be, you know, climate change could be one thing. There could be an asteroid that hits our, our planet. That might accelerate our willingness to consider synthetic biology solutions or cellular agriculture or genetically modified foods. You know, there's, um, there's religious uh, impacts, there's, there's political impacts, demographics, right? The World Health um, Organization has published, the United Nations has published um, population statistics. If their simulation models are off by just a little tiny bit, instead of being 9 billion people in the year 2050, we might be 30 billion people. That would fundamentally change the way our species evolves, don't you think? We might make some very different choices. You know, on the flip side, if everybody you know, goes off to outer space or, or you know, our population models are much smaller, it might alleviate some of the pressure and some of the religious and cultural things might prevent these um, scenarios from playing out. But the thing that I keep thinking about is um, something that Stuart Brand wrote, um, which is, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. 
You know, Kevin Kelly, in his book, Out of Control, said this amazing thing. He wrote, this is, sorry, I can't read it. This is the dilemma all gods must accept, that they can no longer be completely sovereign over their finest creations. The world of the made will soon be like the world of the born, autonomous, adjustable, and creative, but consequently out of our control. So now is the time to understand where these tools could take us. Now is the time to grapple with the impacts that they may have. We need to encourage the things that we cherish, and we need to contain the things that we abhor. Are there universal morals and ethics that we can all agree on? Do no harm, do unto others. You know, that's maybe the beginning. But these are not easy questions. And you know, something that people thought was outrageous 40 years ago in vitro fertilization is now considered normal. And some would even say it's a basic human right. So this is what we are currently exploring at Neolife. If you'd like to follow along on our process, we'll be publishing a series of um, visions of our future and um, hashing out what a declaration of the rights of homo sapiens might look like. Um, but I think the thing to keep in mind is we are not evolution's final creation. I am in awe of what might come next, and I'm thrilled to bear witness to this neobiological revolution, this historic process. Being a homo sapiens at the top of the food chain is an enormous right. It's an enormous obligation at the same time. And you guys are the leaders of homo sapiens, like it or not. So my question to you is, what is your obligation to our species? So this is our opportunity. Let's make whatever it is that comes after us truly magnificent.